panel discussion. Great, thanks, Tom. I think uh, Amelia will share her screen in a moment. Um, but to kick off then, so, so hi everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be um, to be kicking off the UK Shelter Forum with this session. Um, we have um, an hour, uh, and in this hour, what we'd like to do is to, to start a, a conversation about women's experiences of working in the shelter sector. Um, so we're gonna take about 15 minutes or so for, for introductions and to, um, to present some of the findings of, of a recent survey, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, and then we're gonna have about 40, 45 minutes for a panel discussion. Um, so there's six of us involved in this session. Um, so we'll start out by introducing ourselves. Um, I should say also, although we're all working for, for different organizations, um, we're all taking part in this session today with, with sort of independent hats on. So, so just representing ourselves rather than our, our respective organizations. Um, but I think then if we, yeah, if we start with a quick uh, round of introductions, we can just go in the order that, that we've written there on the, on the um, slide. So if you each sort of switch on your cameras and say hello. So I'll, I'll go first. So, so my name's Laura Haycoop. I'm an urban planner. Uh, I've been working in and out of the shelter sector for the last 12 years or so, currently working for, for IOM based in Geneva. Um, Jude, do you want to go next? Hey everyone, this is Jude Kayali. I am the uh, I am a Syrian working for the Syrian crisis, uh, crisis for the last five years. I'm based in Turkey, Gazi and Tap. Um, I am a mother and an architect, and I am a wash and shelter project manager with Care International. Thank you. Thanks, Jude. Uh, Sadia? Hi, everyone. My name is Sadia Khan. I am uh, an architect and, urban, and an urban planner. And I've been working in the shelter sector on the humanitarian side still since 10 years. And before that, I've been working in the private sector and the development sector. Great. Uh, and Shada? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shada Kahush. I am the shelter program development manager in uh, NRC Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Emilia? Hi there, I'm Amelia Rule, I'm the Senior Shelter Advisor at Care International and I've been working in the sector for 11 years. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thanks, and, and Eva. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone, I am Eva, I, uh, I am an, arch an Spanish architect and I have been working in the humanitarian sector in the shelter and wash sector for the past uh, five, six years and also involved in some development projects. Happy to be here. Great, thank you. Um, and so Emilio and I will be doing a bit of a, a double act with the facilitation in this session. Um, so to give a bit of a background then, um, this this all came about through, through a WhatsApp group, um, which is called the, the Awesome Shelter Women uh, WhatsApp group, uh, <laughs> which has um, been building a, a fair bit of momentum over the last few months. So, so what started out as a, as a WhatsApp group between a, a few friends since January has expanded from, from six women to 180 women. Um, and it involves uh, women working uh, all over the world, working for a whole range of, of different organizations. And essentially the group offers, offers a space for, um, for support, for solidarity, for exchange. Um, it's a very new and informal group, um, which is exciting as it could develop in, in a whole range of different ways over sort of the months and years to come. Um, and there's also now a, a LinkedIn group. So the LinkedIn group is called Women in Shelter. Um, and yeah, so if you are a woman working in the shelter sector or very closely related to the shelter sector and you're not yet part of these groups, then you are um, very welcome to join. Um, so in terms of the survey then, uh, the idea of, of doing a survey came about essentially through, through wanting to, to get a bit of a, a sort of a better understanding of, of experiences of women working in the sector to see what trends there might be um, and to identify key potential actions and, and areas of advocacy. Um, the survey went live a, a few weeks ago and closed uh, just last week and we had 167 responses in total. So um, yeah, which was um, fantastic. Um, so just a couple of things to, to sort of to note up front. So first of all, the, the scope of the survey was really quite broad. There's a lot of different areas that, that it touches upon. And so in a lot of ways, it's just sort of beginning to scratch the surface. Um, secondly, important to note that, um, that the survey and the survey findings don't pretend to represent all women in the sector. So 167 responses is a lot, but it's also not a lot. Um, and so there's clear gaps in, you know, in, in reach and, and limitations. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, the, the survey was only conducted in 
in, in English, for example, which was one limitation and essentially it's been developed, you know, in people's spare time and on zero budget. So there's, you know, some caveats around, around limitations there. Um, also important to note that although, you know, amongst respondents, what we have in common is that we're, we're all women and we're all working in the shelter sector. Um, but obviously when women are not a, a homogenous uh, group, and so in reflecting on, on the survey findings, um, it's obviously important to be conscious of, um, of intersectionality and the, the diversity of experiences, the diversity of backgrounds, um, and recognize, for example, that, that the experiences of, of women of color may differ from, from those of white women, for example, um, and experiences of national staff may differ from international staff. Um, yeah, so just important to note. And then just finally to say um, that this survey is sort of unapologetically uh, focused on, on women's experiences in the shelter sector, but at the same time, it doesn't assume, um, it doesn't assume that all issues raised are, are unique to the shelter sector. Um, and also it doesn't assume that the challenges raised are only faced by, faced by women. Um, so what the survey does do then uh, is it offers a, a starting point uh, starting point in understanding women's experiences in the sector. Uh, it starts to build an evidence base um, and it, it opens up a, a conversation. Um, so there will be a report coming out, um, but we'll need a bit of time to, to work on that, to pull it together. Um, the report will go into the survey findings in a lot more detail. Um, but for now, um, for now, we're just going to share a few of the sort of top level findings to help to, to frame the discussion. Um, so over to you, Emilia. Um, okay, just so um, we collected quite a lot of background information about the different people who, or the different women who have filled out the survey. And we started with mapping which countries people are currently based in. And then we went on to identifying countries of origin. As you can see, we have um, a wide global spread and representation. Um, there is a concentration in Europe and the Middle East. We also went on to mapping the types of organizations that respondents have worked for during their shelter career. So this will also capture when people have changed between different organizations. We captured um, if respondents had experience of working at international or national staff members or both. I'm not going to explain all of the graphs because I'm hoping that they're self-explanatory. <laughs> and we started to focus in on the um, issue of gender and gender balance um, within the shelter sector. So, um, as you can see here, um, basically we asked, for what percentage of time have you had a female line manager? And you can see that for 0% of the time, that was the most commonly answered questions. Um, sorry, the most commonly answered uh, option with 23 of res respondents saying that they've never had a shelter um, manager who was female. Um, and I just want you to think about that in the context that frequently, you know, the majority of the people that we serve are women. Um, going further into the gender balance of shelter teams, we looked at the senior management level where the decision, ma decision making is often made and the community facing shelter team as well. And as you can see demonstrated um, in these pie charts, 60 to 75 percent of these positions are all held by men. Our next question looked at the impacts of having women in shelter teams. So you can see that 63 percent of respondents said they had experienced a positive impact on shelter programming when there was a good representation of women on the team. You can also see on the right here some quotes from the open-ended questions that we included um, in the survey. Just give you some time to read those. So the positive impacts um, were, there was a long list, but these included um, 
more inclusive programming approaches, increased access to women in the community, so better reach, better feedback from women, a broader and more detailed understanding of what the needs were, better data. Um, it was more likely that women um, themselves were involved in the projects and the activities and included in actions such as training and cash for work. Gender and protection and inclusion was mainstreamed and often prioritised more because there were female staff members. And there was also better team morale, efficiency and more support between co-workers themselves. This also led to less discriminatory behaviour within shelter teams and less sexism. I'll pass over to Laura for the next bit. Thanks. Um, so there was a whole um, section also within the survey that focused on, on gender discrimination and threatening behaviour and sexual harassment and, and bullying and victimisation. Um, in the survey, this went into a lot more detail with a, a number of follow-up questions, but some of the sort of the top line um, statistics you can see there. So, so while working in the shelter sector, 55% of respondents um, responded that they have experienced gender discrimination. 36% um, have experienced threatening behaviour, 30% have experienced sexual harassment, 42% have experienced bullying or non-sexual harassment, and 16% reported um, experiencing victimisation. Um, I just want to say that, that we recognise that, um, that some of the, the questions that were raised within the survey were very difficult to answer um, and involved revisiting uh, negative experiences and, and traumas. So we're especially appreciative for respondents for, for putting time and emotional, um, emotional energy into, into responding to the survey. Um, I won't go into depth on, on these points now as we don't have time, but I will just focus a little bit more deeply on the gender discrimination points. If you want to go to the next slide, Amelia. Um, in the survey, there was a question, uh, a follow-up question on gender discrimination to try to break down uh, the sort of the forms of, of gender discrimination that, that people had experienced. And so you can see on, on the graph there sort of how this was um, categorised and, and how frequently those, those aspects were, were mentioned. Um, I'll let you read through that um, by, by yourselves, but just to add that some, some additional points that were raised were saying that, um, that, uh, that a lot of these um, uh, are not one-off incidents, but, but continuous or, or ongoing. Um, and another point that, that was raised that sort of cross-cutting across a number of these different um, strands was a, a lot of people commenting that they had feel that they have to prove themselves um, again and again and again. So not just once, but sort of repeatedly and how exhausting that can be. Um, there were a number of comments that related to, to who discrimination was coming from. Uh, so from a number of different groups and colleagues um, were mostly mentioned, um, but, but also discrimination coming from other groups. So from, from government counterparts, from partner organizations, from local construction workers, from um, community members. Um, and mostly this was um, from, from men, but sometimes also from, from women. Uh, and there were comments also highlighting the, the intersectional nature of, of discrimination, so, so with respect to, to race and ethnicity and, and age, for example. Um, next slide, please, Amelia. Um, there was a whole other section in the survey that, that focused on a series of questions around um, people's experiences of, of thinking about starting a family while working in the shelter sector, uh, and also questions around caring responsibilities. Um, like all sections, there's a lot to unpack here, um, and there'll be a lot more in the report. Um, I won't speak to each of these quotes, but hopefully you can uh, read through some of them as I speak. Um, so on the question of thinking about starting a family, for example, there was a whole range of uh, responses. Some of the top trends in responses were um, that were raised were um, concerns that, that starting a family would mean needing to, to completely change the type of type of role in the sector or leave the sector altogether. Um, a lot of comments about the difficulty of balancing work life and family life uh, and many comments also about sort of risking uh, limiting career progression. Uh, and one point that I'd like to pull out specifically is that uh, the statistic that you can see there in blue on the slide that 58% of respondents who are parents or guardians said that they have faced job insecurity due to pregnancy or caring responsibilities. Um, and in the comments uh, related to this, um, 
one of the things that was highlighted was was around the, the issues caused by by short term contracts and the lack of job security that they offer. So in the quote on the bottom left there, you can see, for example, where it says um, fixed term contracts are often one year length, which considering a nine month pregnancy leaves no room for any job security during or after delivery. Uh, and being a fixed term contract, the employer has the right to not offer another contract. Um, but so I'll, I'll leave it there on, on that side. So if you go to the next one, Amelia. Uh, and then throughout the survey, there are a number of other challenges that were raised uh, in relation to being women working in the sector, quite a lot of practical ones. Um, so some points around lack of access to, to toilets and latrines uh, in some contexts, for example, um, which can have uh, knock, on, knock on health and safety impacts. There were comments on, on personal safety and potential TBV risks, especially related to accommodation and, and travel, for example. Um, there were some comments on privacy, uh, and there were also um, challenges raised related to, to working in, in different cultures where it might be, where there may be um, specific norms or assumptions about the roles of, of women. And while this is um, obviously part of the job, navigating this can still be uh, challenging. Um, so next slide, Amelia. Uh, and then, so the last section in the survey was focused uh, on sort of moving forward. So moving forward um, in terms of looking at what's already being done to address gender equity in the sector, uh, what more needs to be done, what priority actions are needed, and also asking um, women for, for ideas of how the Women in Shelter group could develop. Um, so I won't go into this in, in any detail now, as I think a lot of this will, will hopefully come out as we start the discussion. Um, but I will just highlight this one question uh, that's highlighted on the on the slide here. So, so we asked whether women thought that, that current policies and initiatives to improve gender equity within their organisation are sufficient, um, and only 20% of respondents uh, agreed or strongly agreed. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, and I think we'll um, we can move on to the on to the discussion. So Amelia, back over to you. Hi. Um, well, I hope that that's um, given everybody some food for thought. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to open up a panel discussion um, with Sadia, Eva, Jude and Shada. Um, and I will do my best to facilitate, but I, I'm sure it will be a beautiful flow of natural discussion. Um, so I think, you know, for, for the first topic to consider, um, perhaps we could just start with some of the panel's reflections on these findings. Um, and it would be nice maybe I'll, if we could kick off perhaps with um, Sadia and then go from there and work between um, each person in the, in the panel. Thanks, Sadia. Sure. Thanks, Amelia and uh, Laura for this great presentation and putting all this together. Uh, where to start? <laughs> We're 2021 and we are in the shelter sector and uh, and it's high time and you can see it from these results that it's high time to actually kind of take that problem at heart and, and work around more inclusive policies in our organizations. Um, I'll illustrate with an example. So as I mentioned in the introduction, I started to work with the shelter sector uh, from the humanitarian side about 10 years ago. And before that, I was in the private sector working in Belgium. In the construction, I was working as an architect and an engineer. And when I entered the humanitarian shelter sector, there was this very reputable uh, organization I wanted to work for, a European organization. And this is a genuine and recurrent conversation I had with their HR management, who said he was a man, a white man, who told me, you know what, you've got a great profile, but we hire 95% from our, for our staff, we hire from the global south. I was utterly confused by his response because I thought two things actually came to mind. One, the global south is not a homogenous blob of people. And two, I'm a woman, a woman of color, working in a predominantly male environment, um, in a predominantly white country. So, uh, and so I was utterly confused by, by, by that response. And that was a, it's, it's a recurrent thing that happened a few times afterward as well. And I thought, but uh, now 
reflecting again on these results, I thought we have to do away with these, what I would call lazy HR policies or archaic HR policies and really look at the complexity of our teams and, and thanks goodness that there's that diversity. Uh, because there's no doubt that diversity is a, is a strength. And how do we do that? Some good examples though that I've seen is that certain organizations while working on these HR policies include people and, and so different women, women of color and other uh, maybe minority groups sit at the table and discuss the policies together. And what comes out of that as a product, as a policy is, is much more inclusive and equitable. And um, those policies can not only be focused on how you hire and the panels, those are very important things and how job descriptions are made. These, these again are very important parts, but equally focused on how there's actually space created for women. Because once you're hired, the battle is not won. As, we, as was mentioned a couple of times in the survey, you need to prove yourself again and again and again. And unfortunately, it doesn't get easier when you get in senior management positions, on the contrary. So creating that space is equally part of that whole process. I'll stop here and pass on. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Adia. And I think um, you, you also touched there a little bit on, you know, what the ways forward are and how we can work a little bit more towards gender equity in the, in the sector. Um, and I hope we can, we can explore that perhaps in more detail um, as well um, in, after we've after we've reflected um, more with the other panelists on on their reactions to the to the survey, um, so um, Jude, um, are you happy to happy yeah. to respond? And also, like between between panelists, feel free to um, you know make it a flowing discussion and, and interject if if you would like to or support each other in uh, um, any comments that are made that you agree with. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Emilia. Actually, the, the survey or the results weren't really um, shocking for me. Uh, we know it, we knew it mm. uh, since like the beginning. We knew there is um, a gap, a huge gap in our field. It's not only in the humanitarian field, it's everywhere. So I start working as an architect in Syria, then I moved to Algeria, Turkey, and now I am in the humanitarian field and I still feel there is a kind of undermining your, your experience, your knowledge, mm -hmm. your contribution. In every meeting, in every single meeting, I need to prove myself that, look, my point of, of view is valid. You might not mm -hmm. like it, we might not agree on it, but you should, or we should consider it. it might, I might be wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not like 100% making what, a, a right decision. No one can be mm. sure that 100% you are right. But sitting in every meeting and in, in, in every context, trying to prove yourself that I have a way of thinking that it should be considered on, your, on our programming, on our daily life, mm. on our decision, it's something tiring actually, and mm. it it's consume you. Uh, and even I remember, like I had my um, APAA with my supervisor, which is a male, and he said, "Jude, you are really good, but you need to watch your tone while you are while you are uh, talking. Like mm. you should not be very aggressive. You should listen. You should be open minded, etc." And I told him, like, actually, I am a woman. And it's a challenge. And I need the person in front me, on the front of me to take me serious. And sometimes I'm acting this way, which I don't like. I, am, mm. I don't agree with this, but I have to. And I'm, I'm still like looking for a decent way or let's say a way of proving yourself in, in a most professional way without really being strict or showing that I know everything. So... Mm take me serious um but yeah this survey told us let's say what we knew uh, mm. form it uh, and now i think that the and we need to expand more we need to reach more people more, more women mm. uh, on this even we 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 meet, we might need to hear from men about their perspective on this um then 
we we pointed out the gap and uh, let's see what we we can do more yeah thank you yeah thanks so much eva or shadow would you like to would you like to follow up lots of interesting things that to pick up on there thanks yeah well as as uh, sadia and Jod said uh, the results were we knew that this was like this was uh, gonna come up but uh, still is shocking to see the percentages and to see also the experiences and um, while the, the, during the introduction uh, it was explained how this group was born and, and how supportive this platform is and I think that uh, this what I am really really happy to see this happening now because it is not just because we can show it here now and we are all together and and you can be engaged on this also which we are on it, I think, but we are doing our best. It's also this platform that, that has been born uh, maybe one, uh, three months ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a platform, a supportive platform that I have never seen in my life. I don't know if in the humanitarian sector that is a type of supportive mechanism established like this one. This is the, a safe place where you can express how you are feeling, even feeling this survey was, as, as Amelia said, it was extremely, or, or, or Laura, I don't know who mentioned during the presentation, it was extremely hard for us to feel that. And after completing the survey, you were feeling really drowned because you need to go through all the experiences on your life. And we have experienced similar from Sa what, what Sadia has explained and what um, you have explained. I can also share some examples. And I, also it, it was, I was laughing when Jod was mentioning about the comment of you need to be uh, you are good but you need to be more polite is how how what person can support uh, during your work when you are every day in a hard environment going to meetings pushing for things to happen and people are not looking at you in the meeting you are asking something or you are pointing something and the people don't look at your eyes because they look at the man that is sitting next to you there is a point where of course, it's like you, you scream and you say, please look at me. <laughs> so um, uh, we can maybe uh, after with all the panelists uh, share more experiences, but I think that also here is, this is a great opportunity for share with all of you our situation and encourage more women to share, but of course to encourage men and you colleagues to engage on this, to support us during this process, because you know and you see, but maybe we didn't explain all of our feelings because sometimes also some of them are quite taboo. So it's hard to explain that, but now we have removed our mask and open uh, all our feelings and, and share it with you. So I, I'm very hopeful for this, uh, this to be the beginning and an inflection point for something better. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eva. Uh, Emilia, can I add on Eva? Actually, this is a group that made or give me this space where I can be woman, proudly a woman, and I can share my concerns, my my issues, my my dreams. It's like, do you have any position so I can apply to? It gives us a kind of comforting space, which is very um, unusual. Uh, despite or all our differences. I might sit, for example, with Eva in any meeting and we won't like each other. So we don't, meet, we don't need to meet again and we don't build this relationship in the future. But with this group, there is, there is, uh, there is only two common things, being a woman and a shelter in, in, the, in the shelter field without considering any of the other differences. And this is very special and unique actually. I never been in such a place before or such a platform, let's say. Yeah, a virtual space. <laughs> um, Shada, um, would you like to, to add? Yeah, I mean, I, Jude said, I mean, Jude uh, said that we know this is happening and I think we all do, but it was still surprising to me seeing the numbers, you know, in, in, in front of the statements. Um, and I think for me, the most shocking one at this point was, or my, the initial shock was, 
um, particularly for community facing teams. I mean, how many of us sit in, you know, writing every day, gender balance teams, gender balance teams, and then now we see that it's not actually the case. And I, I, I for me, that was that was um, shocking because um, particularly that statement of housing is a woman's issue. And, you know, in the introduction, you said most of our beneficiaries are female. I mean, that is a, for, that is such a, a red flag in a way, um, I would say. But um, just echoing also then what Eva and uh, Jude were saying, we all have felt this. We've all gone through different uh, challenges. Um, but I don't think in my entire career I've ever spoken to someone about it. Um, and it was, um, you know, seeing this conversation start, it's, it's really interesting. And I think it's going to um, be very interesting how we take that forward. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a great initiative and uh, it's good to see the different um, challenges that people have faced and how they are uh, overcoming them as well. Yeah, that's it for my side. Um, yeah, I just I would like to to to, to echo that um, that we you know I think Laura explained the group started or well, the WhatsApp group started um, as a, a smaller group and then as we started to discuss topics that we realised were very important and in line with a lot a lot of feeling in the sector that we wanted to widen that discussion, um, but the sheer amount of or well, the number of women working in our sector that joined um joined the group within let's say 10 days um was was astounding to us and i think what was you know, really important to me was that we might we might think that that there's not that many uh women working in in shelter but then when we are proactively re reach out and create this space we see that we are there um, and so perhaps it's more about our representation and, 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 and our voice. Um, but I think certainly no one, I think lots of people have, have said that, you know, no one's ever asked these kind of questions ever before. Um, so, you know, this is, it's a great, it's a great starting point. <laughs> over to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, actually, Emilia, you're right. Uh, uh, filling the survey was a, a bit painful for me because you need to go through all, as Eva said, all your experience. And in addition to being underestimated, although there is a lot who supported you and like feeling um, blessed to have someone supporting you actually in the work field, in your family, with your family, etc., is something to consider. It's like, do men feel blessed because their manager is understandable, understanding your challenges, your daily challenges, for example. But this is a feeling I'm having every day. So it's like, thank God I'm working in a very like, um, um, in a healthy environment that I can raise my complaints if there is any. Uh, being a mother working in COVID with my child in the house and my supervisor is always like understandable if, if, I, um, if I answered the email late. But at the end of the night, you, I ended up in my bed asking myself, I am, a, am I a good mother? Am I um, a good manager? Am I a good wife? Uh, did I do my best? Uh, did I did this right or wrong? And then like all, all the pressure coming again and again to you. And then like, thank God my husband is, um, is very open-minded and my family is very supportive and my, my team is very under uh, um, uh, there for me. But it's a lot, it's a lot to carry on. It's a lot of burden on you and always you are judged. So I am late on my decision because I'm woman. It wasn't really a right decision because I'm a woman. Um, like, but I am a human. I might make mistakes. I might be good. I might be wrong. But it's not because I am a woman. It's because I'm a human, you know? So, yeah, this is the, the daily challenge personally I'm facing. But uh, 
there is a lot to be done, I think so. And if I can jump here and add something also. Uh, so here we are always talking about uh, special needs. And here in some of the comments, in some of the conclusions during the questionnaire, you can see, for example, and these are the ta taboo topics that I really think that we need to bring into, into the table also. Like, for example, the, are, are you uh, realizing that, for example, in me personally, I have been in the field and for three months I wasn't, not just not going to the toilet during the day, not drinking water in the desert because there was no toilet in the area. I was, for three months, I needed to carry this reconstruction project. There was no men, no tree and it was a conflict area, so I needed to be with escort. And I wasn't feeling safe if I needed to go to the toilet with a, an escort who didn't speak actually the official language. So, and all these challenges, of course, as I, I was surprised to see that it is so common and that there are urinary, urinary infections, that urinary infections are super common in the, in, in the, for the women in the, working in the shelter sector, but these are never told because it's a taboo. It's, and if we have our period, we also have a special needs and <laughs> we are, and actually um, we, if, if you are passionate about your work and, and me, have, I have been in the, in very, in hard duty stations for, for a long time. And I remember also, uh, I even questioned myself, but I remember at the beginning of my career, at some moment I was uh, going to the, to an interview with a, with a great organization and the process was super long. The process was uh, like, it was taking months and I needed to fight for the final process. I need to move to the other country to do the pre to do the, all the interviews, all was clear with HR, everything. And then it comes to the technical part and no technical question was addressed. There was no technical question. It was just, I think if it was not asked five times, it was 10. Are you sure that you will be okay in the bush? Are you sure that we, you will be okay in the bush? And then I was like, once that I have been, and, and I was already, I, ha, I had already, at that moment, I had already experience in the bush. And then after facing all these challenges, it's like, well, that's true that it is challenging for us. And, but this interview, the technical interview was carried by two men and they never, of course, the, the way that you feel at that moment, at that moment, you have, gone through all the process, you are committed, you really want to go there, you really want to do, to do this job and you, have, and you have demonstrated that. But the way that these are not considered and these are not encouraged, the, we want gender equality, but how you want to, to achieve that. And also if, yes, we want to be in the bush, but we also need to, <laughs> need to be, we need empathy and also in, this, in the sector to understand that we have a special needs and some and and maybe support from at that point at that moment maybe some support from our men colleagues will will help, but it's the op, at, at least it was the opposite of that at that moment with the recruitment team, that was at that time it was in that moment it was a, a men team, so it is really it's really challenging and I think that uh, most probably these these topics are if if we don't tell you you will not think about it. And um, so I think that it's important also to bring it up. Can I jump in here just with a, and I'm, I'm uh, I just also want to acknowledge all the experiences shared in the chat box and, and reading them, whether that's Liz and, um, and others that I've shared just now, reading them, I, every time you have a flashback, I'm like, oh yes, that moment in the camp when there was no place to go, that three hours, what happened, you know? And and uh, I wondered, I wondered a lot about this. Um, also, myself being in a managing position is that our managers, our team managers, are are not equipped to deal with uh, with dynamics and and certain dynamics around gender, and with the best of wills. I, I uh, when uh, Jude was talking, I was thinking that I never went to a manager and, and explained never that there was an issue. I have never ever did that. I did it once actually, and that was because I had a manager and she was a woman. And this was an interesting example because 
there, this was a coordination meeting and I was in the country for a couple of weeks and uh, I realized that I wasn't saying much in meetings because I was just taking everything in, but I realized that the women were shut down every time in the meeting, quite aggressively. Every time there was an idea, they were just shut down. And I thought, I'm new, I'm not understanding this dynamic, let's just wait. Until two women came to me and said, thanks goodness you're here because now we're going to be stronger together. I didn't know what to say. I had no idea how to deal with it. So I said, great, this time I have a woman manager, so I will ask her, she will know. And I went to her and I said, do you notice that, that, you know, this is how, and then my next, before I could ask the question of how could we potentially, you know, change this dynamic or do something else, she just said, oh, you know, every woman has to deal with it. I had the same in Bangladesh. And that was the end of our discussion. And otherwise very nice woman, by the way. But I realized that, it wasn't ill will, she was actually not equipped and I was not equipped being a woman to deal with this situation. So I feel like it's not by a diversity training that you can get there. There needs to be targeted things to equip the managers better around these issues. Following on Shadia, actually, it's not only giving a space to women to apply or to hire one woman in this in the working space actually it's to make this space able to accommodate the woman needs it's not only that there is a woman in here attending the meeting it's giving her a space to talk giving her a time to go and take care more of her children uh, giving her a room to breastfeeding her children for example i ask in my recent job a lot to have this child, childly friendly, spa, child friendly space that I can bring my child and take care of him while I'm doing my job. It's an extra load on me. I know that it's 100% on me because no one will take care of the child. If you send it, if you send him to the daycare, uh, there is someone taking care of him. But I want to be there with my son. I want him to see me working. I want him to see me to see to see what I'm doing. And yes, they heard me. They tried their best. But the regulation, the state regulation, the the Sigorta regulation, did not allow that. So it's not the work only. It's everything. The gap is really the, the problem is really big. And to to solve it, there is a lot to, to, to work on. I need a space to cry in my work. I don't know if you have this feeling under the pressure. It's like, if I am, I want a room to go and just to cry, cry it out. And I remember a friend of mine was crying and her boss came in and he saw her crying. And he said, what's the problem? I'm like, I didn't get this job, blah, 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 blah. I didn't do it well. And he said, yeah, I know now why I don't hire women because they all cry a lot. And I was like, no way. <laughs> it's like, crying is a healthy way of expressing yourself. Let me cry. What do you care? It's me crying. Why, why, it, why I should be judged? Why I should be always strong and, and like up to everything? I'm weak. I make mistake. I'm a woman and I'm proud of being a woman. And I'm, I'm, I'm really like, again, I want to make a change and I know the change will start with my son. Anything else is just like we are playing with it, modifying it. Our mentality, there is a some, like I know, because I know that I, it's in my brain because my mother raised me this way, that my community raised me this way. There is a lot there and we need to unpack them slowly, slowly. But my son is my hope he will be able to automatically, without thinking, appreciate and understand the special need of women. Yeah. So powerful, Jude. And I think you're also reflecting um, a couple of the comments in the chat there as well about you know, this also being built in internally within us as women that we don't necessarily even recognize a situation where we are being discriminated against um yeah i'm quite overwhelmed <laughs> yeah i also feel that uh, what you said i don't know if uh, that there is a um, there was a video a viral video last uh, last year i think it was uh, 
about I don't remember the, the name of the actress, but um, it was about you, uh, you need to be uh, like we need to be we are asking our society to be a woman like you cannot chat, you cannot scream, you need to wear nice, you need to blah blah blah, to do this, this, this. And then in the humanitarian system, because of all this, at least in my personal experience, because of all these challenges that uh, your voice is not listened, etc. In my in my in my personal experience, I need to block my femininity at some point. I was remember, I remember at this, I was dressing the most darkest way, that the most serious way that I could, so the people will take me seriously. And I cannot wear colors, or I cannot wear like girly, because it, I will not be considered. I need to, so, and then of course, in the other side, to receive the complaints, and here we come to the, to the other side of colleagues or men in the field saying, oh, why don't you wear in the other clothes? Why don't you dress nicely? Why don't you are more, more women? And all these inappropriate comments also at some point. So we are, at, at, I think that uh, and until the moment, and I think that most probably all women feel that, feel, uh, experience that, that feeling. Until the moment that you feel enough uh, secure and proud, you say, I'm, I'm a woman, I'm proud to be a woman, and I will be myself and I will do, I, I will behave in the way that I, I, I need to behave and I will feel good with my own identity because we need to block our identity and also uh, also align with, the, with this and with Jod was, comment, was, was mentioning out crying that you need to cry sometimes you are overwhelmed. Also we have hormones as <laughs> everyone has and sometimes you, you want to cry but you cannot. And then we become machines. And in the humanitarian sector, this is very common, not just for women, to become machines, not to feel because we need to protect ourselves and not to express anything because you need to be hard and efficient and, and you cannot feel. And we are humanitarian, you are, we are human, we are working with humans, we need to connect with humans. And then also from this, I, I will uh, connect with a comment that I saw in the chat box uh, about uh, when I was mentioning the issue of the, of the toilets, how if I feel like that, how will the female, female beneficiaries will feel? And that's totally right. And that's the, in the, the positive, one of the positive impacts of having women in the, in the sector is that if we are, if our, the majority of our targeted populations are women, the most vulnerable are women, uh, when you are a woman, and me, I, I have experienced this working both in the shelter and the wash sector, sometimes women will not talk with, with men and they will not tell you what they, what they really need. And I, and I really need to have, you can have focus group discussions separated with a man, but also I always ask for a, a join, a private meeting. And in the private meeting, you will listen more and you will hear the real story and the real needs. And they are the, the ones who stay in the house, the one who are facing the challenges in the toilets, etc. So you, you really need, if you are working in the shelter sector and the work sector, you really need that information, but the, it is not easy for, for them to share it openly if there is no, if they don't feel uh, comfortable. And even I remember one, once uh, it was a very beautiful comment, but sad <laughs> that uh, during uh, one of these uh, experiences, I, I, I was doing an assessment it was a community, a very beautiful community, which was, because this comment was from men. It was a very a strong community feeling. And I arrived, it was a community who ne that never received assistance for a long time. And I was doing an assessment. And uh, I remember in the first, the first day, the first day they didn't tell me. When I came back, they said, we knew when, when we saw you, we knew that something will happen because you are a woman. And it was coming from a man because, well, I, I guess it was, I don't know why, but maybe because, I don't know, it was just a beautiful comment, but also sad because, uh, and it was funny that it was coming from a man. So he was really empathic also with that. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, Eva. Um, we've had a few, you know, really supportive comments um, from everybody and, and from men in the in the chat 
Um, and I thought it might be a nice time to now to for the last um, bit of this panel discussion to move into you know what other like what are the positive actions that we can that we can do in the shelter sector to move further towards gender equality and to you know help this experience of women working in this sector. Um, so um, if it's okay, Shada, would you be able to speak to that? first and then we'll go around again. Um, thank you. Sure. Um, I mean, it was a very interesting discussion um, and a lot of things were already raised about how, how we can move forward. But I think we need to we need to also think of this not, I mean, obviously it's happening at a higher level of management and everything, but it's, it's, it's happening at all levels of our work. And, um, and I don't think we've been tackling it. I don't think we've been addressing it directly that you need to treat your female colleagues better. You need to, I, and I think that's that's where we're lacking it in a way. Um, as just as an example, when I first started out, male homeowners would not take me seriously at all. And then my male colleague had to say, her word is as good as mine. So it's, I think that, and that really helped build that trust with the community that we were working for. And I think, we need to be better at just addressing this really directly and being very frank also with our teams and our line managers on uh, your, th these are the issues we're facing. We're not hiring more women. We're not doing all, and, and, and um, someone said it's about, for instance, when the pol policies are written in place, talk to one another, talk to other people. It's not, it's not rocket science, I think at this point. Um, but yeah, those are um, just kind of my reflections on this. Um, hope I answered the question. Over. Who, who else would have liked to contribute? Um, what, how can we move forward? I think there is two ways that we need to focus on. Uh, it's not separated, rather it is um, completing each other, let's say. The first one is how to hear more from the women beneficiaries, how to reflect on their needs. It's not only the challenge on us, it's also on the beneficiaries themselves. Um, I remember like we are doing a shelter rehabilitation in the house, in the shelter, and a complaint came to us saying that the woman said the kitchen, she doesn't want the kitchen to be placed in this corner. She wanted to be placed outside, but the engineer didn't really listen to her. So she complained to us and I received the complaint and I was like, what? Seriously? So we tried in our programming to make sure that the women are her. However, how can I make sure that those women are, or the need of those women are really reflected? Is it by keep filling the gender markers on our activities without, and like writing it, without really actioning it? How can I make sure those women, in the, in, in, those beneficiaries women are really, really heard and their needs are really, really reflected? It's not only to add a basket on the toilet for their pads. It's, it's not only distributing the pads. It's a whole mechanism between us and the beneficiary that should be adapted to change. I don't know what is the right terminology, but there is a lot to be done there. The second part is the, the, the worker or us, the employees, how to make sure that there is enough women and there is, I don't know how to, to define it, but I don't know if qualified woman is the right word for it, but to have the right woman in the right place. So you don't create a, a lot of pressure on her or underestimated her. And with putting her on the right place, build on it, like what's, what she can do, what she's special in. Let's invest more on this. Let's, for example, like I am in the wash and shelter. I might be awful in wash. So someone should tell me, move to the shelter, <laughs> leave the wash aside, for example, I'm giving. So invest more on this unique, um, unique power, let's say, or unique uh, contribution of women. Um, that's how we need, how 
I don't know, there is a lot to be work on the policy, on the HR standards, on the management level, on our understanding, on our reflection, on how to really make the, 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 the documents that we keep mm. writing and integrated in our proposal, like the gender markers, it's an old proposal, I think. But actually, are they are done? And I remember, like, I'm, I'm facilitating the gender markers. And the other side is like, Jude, let's be serious. This is like, yeah, I will tell you this. Yes, yes, we will do this and we will do that. But are they actually done? So how to really action and make it in place? Yeah. Uh, so a lot. Yeah. So I think, you know, picking up very much on wait, we need to practice what we preach. We actually need to follow up on actions in, in programming when we are mainstreaming gender, but then we need to reflect that, not just at a program level, but at an institutional level and all the way through all the different um, levels of um, staffing and have, you know, perhaps, a, you know, as we've kind of suggested one way forward is having more women in, in leadership roles, having more, women um, in decision-making roles um, and in shelter teams, but you know, again, gen generally. But what are the, you know, what are the barriers to that and, and what do we need to, it's, need it's to overcome? A woman and there is no, and you are keeping on the working hours, eight hours a day. Most of the women weren't able to apply because they have responsi responsibility in their houses. Like we are a, a, a wives and a, a parents and like, I need to plan my family. I need to do a lot. Mm. So it is my decision to be a housewife, a manager and an architect and a mother and a wife. And it's all bored on me. And at the end of time, I'm, I'm sitting, it's like, why I'm doing that? Why I don't resign and enjoy my time with my son? And it's every night a question I'm asking myself. No mm. one decreases the working hour from eight hours to, to five for women. I know that for a fact. But how? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe maybe uh, Sadia or Eva or Shada <laughs> or Laura will have some have some solutions. Um, we have a we have a few a few more minutes left to you know solve this solution <laughs> solve this problem <laughs> um and then we will have to wrap up and you know but I, I hope that this conversation will continue um I think one of the things that you know we're, we're touching on now is is recruitment is the way that the jobs are designed and some of the you know the mm -hmm. barriers that that sets up and perhaps terms of reference um including you know you know, for me, it would be looking at culturally in each setting, um, what are we writing in terms of references, which are perhaps adding barriers to women applying to those jobs, or what, what are we not writing into those job descriptions? Um, and I think there is often a discussion about hard and soft skills um, as well that starts to be a gendered discussion, um, which I find quite interesting in terms of trying to create a gender balance and a skills balance team. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to, to, to build on that, or if you would like to speak to something completely different, then please feel free. <laughs> sure. I'll just have a quick point there and then Eva, maybe you have some others too. Um, I think, I think there is something that you had said as well earlier that I, I would like to really strengthen is that, and this is something I experience as a cluster coordinator. I've done quite a bit of that. And, and I, every time we look looking at a strategy, we're like thinking about what women need, what women need, what women need, but we weren't necessarily thinking about what they can do, the potential there in the project participants. And I think, I think sometimes our programs take that agency away. So very concrete example in DRC, women build their homes. They take care that their children are safe, and are, are even after displacement, very quickly, they, they work around things to make sure that there is a sort of a house available for their children. And that's huge potential. And none of our programs were actually looking at that potential in itself. So just be very mindful of, you know, that, that dynamic. And we called it gender dynamic in the household. We tried to, we tried to bring it about. And, and it's true that it was on the table because I was cluster coordinated. I was 
you know, there was the first woman cluster coordinator after a while uh, and predominantly male teams. So I think creating or reinforcing that agency, that potential that exists is very important. And equally so, we talked about policies, but behavior change is, is long due. And uh, one of the very uh, positive examples that I've seen, I would like to just uh, share is that actually looking at our management systems is hugely important. The way the hierarchy in our management system is, is a little bit outdated. And to create, we talked a lot about creating space for women to talk on equal footing, right? But that's the way you manage a team as well, bringing out those potential like for men, women in the team and having a sort of a sort of configuration uh, that, that allows that space as well as again, as a team manager, as a team leader. And I think those are things to explore um, and, and think uh, hopefully over time they become mainstream in our organizations. Thank you. Um, if I... <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna just echo some final thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna just echo some of the comments I read quickly because there are so many interactions. That's super nice to see. I hope that we will also keep record of all these messages uh, of how men can support, uh, can be more supportive with women, just listening and asking, asking questions to us and really try to connect with us and have fun normal conversation with us and asking about our our thoughts, our feelings, our needs, and also, of course, also as as, uh, as uh, Sadia said, of also seeing out the potential on, on, on women uh, in a different, I don't know, it's, it's, um, it's hard to say, but it's uh, like uh, um, to understand that the skills also are not just uh, uh, what is our what the career and and we know that, but it's not based on the background or the or what did you study. It's also we have so many skills and we have different skills, men and men and women. So trying to uh, understand that and 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 promote that and so just talking with us. It's just. Mm, talking and also me uh, while talking and while sharing uh, this, you can also uh, support us in the, in the field when we are in the field or when we are having discussions and you see that you will notice immediately what we are talking about now because you will know already. Fantastic. Um, I, I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to bring this panel discussion to an end. I'm enjoying it so much. Um, it could go on forever. Um, but I am going to hand over to Laura just to to tie up. Um, but thank you so much for those that have contributed and the and the questions as well. Laura. Great, thank you. Um, thanks. That was such a such an interesting and such a rich discussion. Um, I did warn everyone up front that we were just scratching the surface. Uh, and I think with so many of these aspects, we could, you know, sort of go deeply into any number of them and have a whole conversation on uh, on all of these different aspects and, and also in relation to, you know, to, to, to challenges and also to, to what needs to change. So I think this really is a, a starting point for a lot of future, future conversations, hopefully. Um, I think also, I guess, sort of one <laughs> overarching comment, I suppose, is that, um, in thinking about improving gender equity, I guess it's clear that, uh, you know, improving gender equity in the sector would would be um, better for women, uh, it would be better for men, uh, and it would lead to better programming, so it's win-win-win. Um, in terms of wrap-up, um, a whole bunch of thank yous. So thank you so much to um, to all of the panelists for being involved in this session, to Jude, Chada, Sadia, uh, Eva, thank you so much for, for sharing your experiences and sharing your insights and also for being so uh, willing to be part of a conversation that, that's, um, that's not that easy to be a part of. Um, and a huge thank you also to everyone who's contributed in the chat and shared your, your thoughts and reflections. Um, a big thank you as well to, to everyone who, who completed the survey and that has, has engaged in, in the survey and, and contributed to that. Um, and also a special thank you to everyone who supported in the process of, of developing the survey. So um, 
in, in feeding into the, the survey design and in reviewing the graph and in data analysis, I think there were between 20 to 30 women from the group involved. So it was a, a massive team effort. So it's a really, uh, really impressive collaboration, uh, I think. So thank you so much for that. And lastly, a big thank you to UK Shelter Forum for, for providing this, this platform for, for us to be able to have this conversation. Um, so then just lastly, in terms of next steps, um, as mentioned before, there will be a report um, coming soon or at some point and when it when it is ready we'll be sharing on, on all of the sort of usual humanitarian shelter type platforms so so we'll make sure to disseminate that when um yeah once it's out so watch this space um and thank you thanks very much <laughs>